Hello, I'm Philip Crang, and I'm really pleased to be able to speak to you tonight as part of the Royal Holloway Geography for Schools lecture series. The title of my lecture tonight is The World on a Plate, Culinary Connections, Globalization and Changing Places. Uh, and perhaps just to say a little bit in terms of explaining that title, three foci that are going to run through the lecture tonight. The first of those is an interest in foodscapes. And foodscapes is a geographical term to describe the places and spaces where we eat or otherwise meaningfully engage with food. Secondly, and more specifically, the lecture tonight is going to be interested in culinary connections and networks that are shaping our contemporary foodscapes. Uh, and thirdly, the lecture is going to be speaking to how foodscapes and these culinary connections are a really great example to think about broader debates about globalization and its impacts on the places that we live in and how we experience place. So as an aside, I should say that the lecture is deliberately designed to key into both place as a topic in the A-level geography curricula, but also to connect it to other topics uh, and other learning, for example, on globalization. In terms of the plan for the lecture, uh, I couldn't resist a, a corny food pun, so apologies for that, but it's really in three parts. There's a starter, we're going to think about a particular place and its foodscapes. Uh, and the place we're going to look at, for reasons I'll explain them in a minute, uh, is a, a small town called Neha in Andalusia in Spain. Then the main part of the lectures is going to focus on two understandings of the culinary connections shaping contemporary uh, foodscapes. Uh, and jargon alert needs to be sounded here. These can be described as a focus on globalization. Uh, and translocalization, but don't fear I'll explain what those terms mean and who's used them uh, when we get to that part of the lecture. Uh, and then finally, as our final course, be more like a sort of quick shot of espresso at the end, I want to reflect on how an interest in food and foodscapes uh, could be a really powerful way to think about places uh, and the ways in which they're changing. So the lecture then is going to be in those three parts, uh, and we'll begin with the, the starter. And as I said, we're going to focus on a particular place, Neha in Andalusia, southern Spain, marked here by the red dot. You can see it just along the coast from Malaga. Uh, and this kind of place hasn't been chosen entirely at random. Uh, it's our usual, until we were interrupted by COVID, our usual first year field trip destination. So every year we take the whole of the first year uh, to Neha uh, for a field trip. Uh, and more specifically, this is the hotel that for the last few years we've been staying in, the Rio Monica uh, Hotel. Now, in terms of the foodscapes of Neha, if you come out of the hotel and turn right, well, about the first area you'd hit was the Plaza de los Cangreos. This is a recently redesigned uh, kind of urban regeneration uh, area where designed as a kind of public space for gathering uh, and where food is central to that. So the provision of food is obviously really important to that. Restaurants line it, get lovely views of the sea, etc. But what food? Well, primarily it's Italian food in this part of southern Spain. Uh, and that Italian food can vary. It can be uh, slightly more expensive, as in the restaurant Vitaliano da Crastina, or it can be a little bit cheaper, as in the menu there on the right from Little Italy. But broadly, it's, I guess, a fairly familiar to most UK uh, visitors, a menu of pasta and pizza uh, dishes of various sorts. Now, of course, that's not the only uh, kind of food that one uh, can consume in Neha, we could turn left out of the hotel, in which case the first restaurants that we meet are Indian restaurants. We can follow that road on further uh, and meet a Mexican restaurant, or we can go a bit further still and eat in a, a rather lovely Thai restaurant. When you arrive in southern Spain, the very first bit of a foodscape that you see is this, the Burger King Whopper Bar at Malaga Airport. And of course, that kind of global branded food is present in southern Spain, not actually in Neha itself, but there's a McDonald's uh, 14 miles away is the, is the nearest McDonald's just along the coast a little bit in the next uh, kind of uh, coastal town. Now, of course, you might be wondering, well, is there no Spanish food in Neha? There is typically Spanish food as mediated uh, for the tourist market in Neha. So there are paella restaurants, they're called chiringuitos. Uh, these kind of large outdoor, large paella restaurants, there are tapas bars, etc. But broadly, the argument would be that with 
uh, as a group. We've left uh, from the southeast of England, a lot of us from London, and what we're encountering are foodscapes that are really very similar to those that we left behind in London. So in London, one would also find casual dining Italian restaurants. One would also find Indian restaurants. One would also find Mexican restaurants, Thai restaurants. You're getting the point. One would also find the kind of global brands like McDonald's uh, are, are kind of ubiquitous in, in London. Of course, you can also find Andalusian food uh, in London. So what are we to make of these kinds of foodscapes? What do they tell us about the factors that are changing places today? And what I want to do now in the main part of the talk is really focus on two different explanatory emphases for these kinds of foodscapes that you can see between Neha uh, and London. So this is the, the main course of the lecture. And as I said, there's two jargonistic words that can describe these kind of understandings, globalization, uh, and translocalization, and we'll take those in turn. So let's start with this term, globalization. Globalization uh, is a deliberately, uh, a term deliberately combines globalization with the word growth. So globalization tries to understand a particular form of globalization, which is about the growth and spread of homogenizing cultures, which are especially being designed, developed and directed by transnational corporations as part of their global marketing efforts, their global branding. Uh, and the argument is that these kinds of global cultures end up eroding local differences between places. Uh, this argument on globalization is especially associated with a, a guy called George Ritzer. He coined the term uh, in various books that he's written, one called the McDonaldization of society, the another about what he calls the globalization of nothing. This idea of a kind of nothing culture, uh, centrally designed commercial culture which spreads uh, around the world. So for George Ritzer, McDonald's, in a sense, is illustrative of a much wider set of processes. So McDonald's uh, has a, a kind of a corporate brand which has literally kind of spread, grown uh, around the world. <coughs> so currently there are about 39,000 McDonald restaurants worldwide. It's not present in every part of the world. It's comparatively weak in large parts of Africa, signaling something about, I guess, the dynamics of this sort of globalization. But it's present in approximately 120 countries, about 69 million customers every day eating McDonald's. If you're in the UK figures, there are about 1300 McDonald's in the UK and just under 4 million daily customers. Uh, what this means is that if we go around the world, we will find a McDonald's in an awful lot of the places that we visit. So if you're in Saudi Arabia, or if you're in China, or if you're in uh, Russia, you're going to find McDonald's. Now for Ritza, uh, makes really kind of three arguments on that basis. Well, this is his kind of globalization thesis. The first of those is he argues that the world's places are being changed by very powerful transnational corporations and their marketing. So he argues that the, the places in which we live are being impacted upon and being changed by transnational corporations and their branding exercises. The second, he says, is one of the changes that's being uh, impacted upon places is the spread of a standardized culture, of a set of standardized cultural forms that are not really from nowhere, but end up everywhere. Uh, in something like McDonald's, that's the logo, but it's also the building, it's the foods, and it's the way of eating those foods. So the particular conventions of how one eats at McDonald's have spread globally. McDonald's has standardized that around those uh, uh, restaurants across 120 countries. And finally, uh, the argument that, that Ritzer makes is that this kind of global culture changes places. He uses a term from a, a French anthropologist called Marc Auger uh, to say that he, it, McDonald's and the McDonaldization, this kind of model uh, of foodscapes, changes places into what he calls non-places. So these are sites that are really made up of commercially designed elements. They're much less organic you know, because they're a very particular kind of place, uh, which he designates uh, non-places. Now, there is one addition that, that Ritzer makes to the globalization thesis, and it speaks in part to this idea about uh, this proliferation of non-places. Uh, and the, the argument he's developed more recently is that globalization is paralleled uh, 
by a, a kind of counter process of, of what we might call glocalization. So the, the jargon's coming thick and fast as us here, uh, but globalization is paralleled uh, with processes of globalization, where globalization designates the localizing of global cultures, the ways in which we might indigenize or, or make more familiar to us or make local uh, these kinds of commercial global cultures. Uh, I guess another way of, of saying that is that Ritzer has begun to recognize that commercial marketing as done by transnational corporations isn't always focused just on standardization or the production of non-places. Uh, it can also be about adapting to local markets, or it may be about trying to create, turn their food venues into certain kinds of places, places that are meaningful to people. And we can see that in quite kind of trite uh, and trivial ways through the example of McDonald's. So <coughs> the McDonald's menu is fairly consistent around the world, but it's not absolutely standardized and uniform. There are local variations in the McDonald's menu. This, for example, is muck spaghetti, which is not available in the UK. But muck spaghetti is the most popular McDonald's menu item in the Philippines. And that reflects a particular Filipino uh, culture of spaghetti as a form of fast food that McDonald's then adopted and incorporated into its restaurant offering, into its own uh, foodscapes. Uh, in India, McDonald's has had to uh, uh, localize in various ways. Clearly, beef eating in India, uh, that's so central to much of McDonald's globally, uh, is not something that they can market. So there's a replacement of menu items. So you get instead the chicken Maharaja Mac rather than something like the Big Mac. Uh, and there's a much stronger emphasis on vegetarian options, which is now spread, I guess, uh, globally as well. So things like the Makalu Tiki, et cetera, because of the, the importance of vegetarianism in uh, Indian uh, diets uh, and cultures. Uh, a slightly broader point here, which is that, that McDonald's perhaps doesn't want its restaurants simply to be kind of commercial spaces. Yes, it wants to design them in particular ways, but it doesn't want them simply to be standardized commercial spaces. It wants them to feel part of people's everyday lives and part of people's everyday experiences of place. And some of McDonald's advertising is very explicitly reflected on that. So this is a, a still from a 2020 UK advert. Um, I won't recount the full plot for you, but uh, if you haven't seen it, broadly it involves a, a, a young man uh, has passed his driving test. And it looks like probably for his 18th birthday or maybe 21st birthday, his mum gives him the keys to her old car. Uh, and this is, I guess, a sort of mixed emotion for him. He's really pleased to have a car. He's not so sure, I think, about it being his mum's uh, old car. But off he drives and he goes down to the drive through at McDonald's. And this kind of rite of passage, this adolescent rite of passage where he's in his own car going through the drive through and then all is right with the world. He's loving having his mum's car and he's feeling great. So McDonald's, they're pitching McDonald's as part of people's everyday cultures, everyday experiences of place and the kind of rituals uh, of our lives. OK, so that's globalization uh, with a twist, but that's the kind of Ritzer approach to how we might think about contemporary foodscapes. But as I said, there's a perhaps a slightly different way to think about them as well. And the bit of jargon here is we can think about them more in terms of translocalization. And this is an approach that's less focused on things like the growth of global brands and more on how uh, food connections, culinary connections are made through a wider range of networks between places. And in terms of, uh, if you want to attribute this to particular authors, well, within geography, there's a literature on what's called translocal geographies. And the main book on that uh, was edited by these uh, uh, geographers, Catherine Brickell, who's based here at Royal Holloway, and Iona Data, who I think now is at uh, UCL. So translocalization then is interested in the flows of people, things and ideas between places uh, and how those connections produce particular kinds of foodscapes where one can experience more than one place at once uh, and where new kinds of fusion or hybrid cultures uh, are produced. Now, those are slightly abstract points. So let me give you some kind of food examples to illustrate uh, these, these kinds of uh, processes. So one of those would be, for example, uh, the development of various sorts of translocal placemaking and branding using foods. So we can think here about neighborhoods that are defined by their foods, 
and branded in relation to their histories of migration. So uh, I'm thinking, for example, of something like London's Chinatown, uh, or more recently, London's Bangla Town, uh, where uh, a Bangladeshi area around Brick Lane, Tower Hamlets Council, branded that as Bangla Town, put a strong emphasis on the restaurant culture there, uh, and used it to presence the, the histories of migration from Bangladesh into the East End of London and to create a kind of new place brand, a new sort of place making. And there are other examples of the outside London. You can think of something like the Balti Triangle uh, in Birmingham as well. Uh, now, those kinds of processes are not only performed at that neighbourhood scale by things like place branding initiatives. We can also think about how restaurants in some ways do this kind of place branding at a smaller scale. They too often relate to, to histories of migration. And a, a good example here would be the UK's 12,000 so-called Indian restaurants. Uh, and the, the, the so-calledness of the Indianness here is that, of course, those restaurants are, are staffed and run by people from across South Asia uh, <coughs> with migration histories from across South Asia, not just India, but Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, uh, etc. Uh, but generically tend to be entitled uh, as Indian restaurants. And about 12,000 of those exist in the UK. So many more than, for example, there are McDonald's. Now, those restaurants relate uh, to changing migration histories and connections between Britain and South Asia. So the very earliest Indian restaurants were very much associated with the British Empire, with the British Raj in India. Uh, the one still remaining, so the oldest Indian restaurant in the UK is Veera Swami and Regent Street in London. Uh, it was opened in 1926. Uh, it wasn't the first Indian restaurant. There were Indian restaurants in the 19th century. Uh, but it has a very similar emphasis to those early restaurants, which was really on catering for uh, people returning from the Raj, so British people returning from the Raj, or Indian travellers who, as part of the empire, were coming to London. Uh, and Veera Swami was founded by Edward Palmer. He was an Anglo-Indian, uh, so his ancestry was both English and uh, Indian. Uh, he was the grandson of a British general and an Indian princess, uh, and it also worked as a spice importer. Now, that's a rather different set of uh, kind of migration histories and, and connections than uh, that then led to the growth of the Indian restaurant, I guess, much more broadly in the post-war period, especially from the 1960s onwards. Uh, so the growth of something like the High Street Curry House was much more associated with mass post-colonial migrations. So no longer part of empire after the end of empire, but migrations from South Asia to the UK or from East African Asians to the UK, which then led to the growth of a, the wider kind of presence of the, the curry house uh, on the British high street. And it's worth saying, of course, that this curry house uh, presented a form of food and a menu, which is really quite distinct from what was present in India. It was very much a, a kind of anglicized or a, a British uh, curry house menu. So things like cheek, chicken tikka masala, vindaloos, all dishes created really for the UK market uh, by entrepreneurs, British Asian entrepreneurs, uh, as a way of, of in a sense, selling uh, what then became called Indian food. Now, more recently, uh, those kinds of restaurants have diversified in various ways, partly for commercial reasons, and that's led to a, a slightly different kind of food being sold and, and presenced and represented in, in British places. So we get, for example, the growth of more authentic national and regional cuisines from South Asia. So here we have Goan food, we have Kerala food or South Indian food, we have Sri Lankan food. Uh, and this is part of a way of, I guess, selling a slightly more authentic kind of food, which could be pitched slightly higher up in the market. There's also been a shift of Indian restaurants into fine dining and into sort of modern Indian cuisine and modern British cuisine. Uh, a famous example of this is the Cinnamon Club. It's the, one of the Michelin starred Indian restaurants in the UK. Its executive chef is Vivek Singh. He was trained in India and came across and in the Westminster Old Library developed this uh, very high dining Indian restaurant. Uh, and his trajectory is paralleled by other uh, I I uh, British Asian chefs who I guess would be fairly famous, someone like Cyrus Todiwala, o OBE, you might have seen on the television, he's been a TV chef, etc. Uh, famous for his restaurant Cafe Spice Namaste. Uh, and Cyrus Todiwala has been really interesting. His career again was trained in uh, India, trained by the Taj Hotel Group, who are the main trainers of, of 
uh, really top-notch Indian chefs, uh, and then moved with his family to the UK and looked to establish that kind of cooking in the UK, but also was really interested in training up local British Asian populations to be part of that kind of skilled chef uh, population. So Cyrus Tadewal has been heavily involved in that. OK, so we'll be thinking about globalization, translocalization of ways of thinking about these kinds of culinary connections. Uh, but these aren't necessarily kind of entirely separate options. Often they, they combine as we're trying to describe uh, how come places have the kinds of food cultures, the foodscapes that they have. And let me just illustrate this by going back to Nehar's sort of casual Italian dining uh, and think about why they're there and what have been the processes that we end up with Vitalio da Cristina. Uh, in the in the plaza in Neha. Uh, because the story of something like Vitalio da Cristina is not simply one uh, of globalization. It's not simply that this is a corporate chain or a franchise. There aren't Vitaliano restaurants uh, all around Europe. Nor is it simply a result, though, of Italian migration to southern Spain. Vitaliano does advertise that its, its restaurant, uh, that its uh, chefs uh, are Italian, uh, but it's not the product of a kind of mass migration of Italians uh, to southern Spain. Its chefs have been recruited as part of its ability to deliver authentic it Italian cuisine. So what is the kind of history of that uh, kind of restaurant? Well, it's been shaped by more complex, I think, multiple culinary connections. And central here has been the shaping of the market that would mean that this restaurant could operate in Neha. And that involves really Italian cuisine's moves to northern Europe since the mid uh, 20th century onwards. Italian immigrants pioneered Italian food, for example, in the UK. And then crucially in places like the UK in Northern Europe, that kind of Italian food became in some ways globalized. It got adopted by corporate chains uh, and introduced to really form a kind of Italian concept for a casual dining experience. Just to, to illustrate that in terms of examples, this is the first pizza restaurant ever in London. It's still going today, uh, but it introduced pizzas in the 1930s. Uh, but pizza was not a kind of hugely popular form of food when it was picked up in the 1960s by something like Pizza Express. Pizza Express as a, as a restaurant was founded in 1965, grew into being a chain, was launched on the stock market in 1993. By 2013, was being bought out by a, a Chinese-based uh, private equity company for about 900 million pounds. And today, Pizza Express has obviously been hit by uh, the, the COVID and the lockdown, etc. It has about 570 restaurants, 470 of which in the UK, about 100 international. So it's become one of these kind of globalizing uh, uh, chains. Now, the move from that kind of UK Italian food culture to southern Spain was then driven by uh, the migrations of northern Europeans, including British people, to southern Spain, uh, both as uh, tourists, but also as immigrants uh, or, or as expatriates, as they're sometimes termed. And that, in a sense, shaped the market for the restaurants in Neha. So absolutely crucial if you're operating a restaurant in Neha is the tourism market. Andalusia gets just under a, about a million international visitors per year pre-COVID. Uh, and I guess we'll be hoping it picks up to those levels again subsequently. Uh, the migration from the UK to Spain, you can see at the bottom of the, the map there, the Malaga district is one of the two with the highest proportion of UK residents uh, living in, in, in Spain. Uh, so heavy UK uh, settlement and migration to that part of Spain. So you end up with Italian restaurants in southern Spain in large part because of the migration of Italian cuisine to the UK and then the migration of UK people uh, to uh, Andalusia uh, and to Neha. Okay, uh, let me just finish off with a, a sort of final course. Uh, let me try and summarize a little bit then about what we've been saying about foodscapes and how they might be a way to think about places and the ways in which they're changing. And on this, I really just want to make six kind of summary points to conclude. So the first of those is what I've been suggesting in this lecture is that foodscapes are an important part of our experiences of places. So if we want to think about the experience of place, uh, food might make a really nice example to kind of explore that. 
Secondly, I've been suggesting that foodscapes are also sometimes key elements of how places are made and branded uh, and those kinds of processes. Think of those uh, names of Chinatown, Bangalatown, the Balti Triangle, etc. Uh, thirdly, <coughs> been thinking about how foodscapes often rely on representations of other places. Uh, if we have an Italian restaurant, an Indian restaurant, or a Mexican restaurant, for example, in part what they're doing is representing those places. So if you're thinking about those issues about how places are represented, you can think about that, yes, in terms of film or video games or other kinds of media, but actually our food cultures are a media through which places are represented to us, through which we get to imagine uh, places that we may never have actually visited ourselves. So we eat in Mexican restaurants, we haven't necessarily visited Mexico. Mexican restaurants become part of our representations of, or our imaginations of, uh, what it means to be Mexican, what Mexico is like as a place. Fourthly, uh, I guess the, the lecture has been suggesting that local foodscapes are, are shaped by wider culinary connections. So like place more generally, places are not simply shaped by processes that happen within them. They're shaped by wider sets of connections and networks. And we can illustrate that through the example of food. Uh, and then fifth and sixth, what I've been suggesting is that those connections can be driven in, in different ways. Uh, they can be driven by transnational corporations, their global marketing, their identifying of particular uh, food consumers. And this we might describe as kind of a process of globalization, something that George Ritzer writes about, especially in relation to McDonald's and McDonald's as a kind of model for other kinds of businesses picked up by the likes of Pizza Express, etc. Uh, but we can also think about how those culinary connections involve wider flows of people, things and ideas across places, uh, which are more complicated. They're not simply kind of corporately controlled uh, and directed. And that we might describe as processes of translocalization uh, and things like the, the, the popularity of Indian food and Indian restaurants as, as labeled in the UK would be a, a great example of that. OK. Uh, look, thank you very much. I, I hope the lecture has been of interest. I'm really looking forward. I think we're doing a and a session next week on the 22nd of November. So I'll look forward to that. Uh, but otherwise, thank you very much uh, for joining us tonight or for listening to this lecture uh, online. Uh, all the best.